So welcome everyone. Welcome to our first women in tech um, in IT session at the Sec for Dev. Um, I have to be honest, I'm overwhelmed how many registrations we got for that event. I never have thought about that and I'm, I'm excited about talking with you today. Um, my name is Stephanie Jacobi. I work at SBA Research and I'm the co-founder of the Sec for Dev. And I work about 16 years in IT now. And I have to be honest, exactly one year ago, it was the first time that I um, was an event for women in IT. Because before I didn't found them and there were not really a lot of them. And I didn't know why to go there. So let's start that nice evening. Um, take a glass of wine or beer in a wine glass. Um, make yourself comfortable, comfortable and Let's start that event. So um, during the planning of the, I need the next slide, please. <laughs> uh, we knew that we wanted to do a women's session this year at the sec for deaf and we thought about the name and we didn't want it to give it the name, so just woman in IT, it's kind of boring. So we came up with um, woman IT, we are no aliens. And why? Because I guess a lot of you know the situation. You come into a room full of men and they look at you um, and look at you like an alien. What are they doing? What, are, what is she doing here? Is she a tech? Is she maybe bringing the coffee? And I never really liked that situation and that looks. So that's why we wanted to show everyone that we are no aliens. Or for example, someone asks you, how is it to be a woman in IT? How is it to be a woman in software design, software development? And you look at them kind of confused because you don't feel different than the colleague next to you. You're the same. You just have a different gender. So that's why we picked the name um, We Are No Aliens. And during the preparation of the moderation and the talk and the session, um, a different picture came to my mind. Julia? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not forwarding the slides, um, so I have to ask my colleague. I was talking to a lot of speakers here and exchanging experience, talking about networking. And also at the same time, had a talk with a colleague, with a friend of mine, talking about women in IT and how all the, how career works in IT. Adela is there. And, <laughs> hi Adela. Um, how it works to, to make a career in IT. And I realized it's a little bit like climbing because the difference is when men start climbing, they can do a lot with their strengths getting up. But we, we have to start or we have, we don't, we are not that strong. So we have to use more techniques to get up. And it's kind of similar being a woman in IT and want to make a career. You have to use different techniques to get up. It, it doesn't, it's not enough to be a man because we are no men. So today we're talking about these techniques and tools, how we can move forward and also help each other. And these, I have to, <laughs> that, that picture is a colleague of mine and we put it into the slide today. I like that picture. So these were the kind of introductions and how and why we wanted to do that session. Let's go to our agenda and the schedule for today. So a big, big thank you to our um, to, to the to our sponsor of that session is powered by Dynatrace and it's also supported by all these networks you can see on that side um, of the slide to make that event today happen. So today we, will, we have a couple of talks um, from women talking about the experience, sharing tools and sharing, um, letting us learn from their experience. And then we have these perspectives on session, which is moderated by Christina Wallmüller. She is leading the woman in IT chapter. And there we have this kind of um, fireplace talks. Uh, talking about education and learning, challenges in work life, leadership. 
And at the end of um, the event today, we have our Women in Career Mentoring and Networking session, which will be, um, which, which are breakout sessions and you can choose your rooms afterwards. So we start today a very warm welcome to Adila Mihic-Zanic. We were a little bit afraid that you can't make it because you had a talk before. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here now. Um, Adela is a businesswoman, female tech leader, speaker and mentor. And she is originally from Bosnia and she lives in Vienna for seven years now with her husband and soon to have a tiny family. Um, I'm very glad that you made it today. She built her career in, in, in Austria from scratch. So she has a lot of experience building her own network. And I heard a talk from you past uh, on the weekend where you said you didn't want to send out hundreds of applications. So you did research and researched where you want to apply, build your network, and then you didn't have to write any application to, to get the job. Very exciting. And I have to talk about your mission. Last year, you had a mission to impact 1,000 women and girls in IT and beyond with her career stories. So I'm very, very excited to hear from you about your experience in networking benefits and the efforts. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Yes, I'm just uh, joining from uh, another event. Uh, uh, that and, and topic that is very close to my heart, uh, power of networking um, for the very executive academy where I am a, a vice president of the female leaders network, global female leaders network that exists uh, two and a half years and has a community of one and a half thousand uh, women executives who did an MBA. Uh, so a really, um, really, really great uh, community to be uh, part of it and, and, and have that experience. Um, so I will not have uh, much uh, slides for you today. Let's see if this works. Mm hmm So I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, once again, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, to address you here. Um, and it's a great opportunity to meet many women uh, in tech, women in IT um, around the, here in Austria or around the globe. So welcome everyone from my side as well. So as um, so Stephanie did an amazing introduction, so I will not uh, repeat uh, much of that. So I, I put one of the hats. So I have many, many hats that I wear. And uh, one of them is, of course, the, the vice president of uh, Female Leaders Network that I just mentioned. Um, yes, so about me. So with, let's start with the 1,000 women. Uh, um, so one year back, so I said I want to tell my story to 1,000 women in tech and beyond uh, to inspire them to dream bigger, to uh, hopefully inspire them to join uh, the career in, in tech and share my side of story. That can be as well uh, me moving from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, so my home country, coming here in Austria without... Uh, any job without any contacts and without even knowing uh, German language. And uh, so this was uh, my mission in 2020. And it has been such an amazing experience. And thanks, thanks to that mission, I'm here to address you all tonight and I couldn't be happier. So about me, so these are just a couple of names, a couple of brands where I delivered my talk in the last last year so maybe some of you uh you know already like the forbes one or the women tech network which is a super super strong community that i can uh really recommend you to be part of it or it girls or the new it girls that are here tonight with us so my journeys uh with thousand women started last year and it's been an, an incredible um to meet not just thousand women at the end were ten thousand of them where i had to um talk in uh, over 40 uh, stages give uh be featured in in many many magazines um as you can see here 
and uh, meet incredible women around the world who are starting their own initiatives and who are as well passionate like yourself about um, about uh, you know bringing more women in tech, about role models, about the importance of networking, about the importance of mentoring, and all of that that you are going to have a chance to experience tonight. And I couldn't not you know stress it enough how how valuable networking uh, and and building meaningful relationships as well as networking is for one's, uh, one's car career. So if there's one thing that I would like you to take from this talk tonight is definitely to get out get out there and and meet people um, like-minded people in your city or in a uh, global who are doing some amazing fantastic initiatives and be you know, part of, of that community and think broader, you know, uh, think, um, I like to say, think bigger than where you are at the moment, um, create bigger opportunities for yourself for the future. And maybe, um, yeah, so this is, this is me. This is just, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, places where I showed up and, and, uh, talked about my career. And as Stephanie, uh, mentioned, um, and maybe, just jump into that. Um, there's a great um, interview uh, with Juliana Rab, remote coach trainer, uh, that um, where I talk about how to land three dream jobs without sending any CV. And the answer to that uh, is about uh, networking. And it's definitely about mentoring as, as well. Because throughout my career there, I had... Um, I was always looking for, for mentors. I was looking as well for mentors within the company. So I had um, mentors uh, in, in the company that I was working and we were working on a very, very specific uh, topic to get uh, my career to the next level within the company. But as well, I was looking for mentors outside of the company, specifically female mentors, because I noticed that I... Um, being, you know, yourself uh, in a in a male-dominated world, and um, uh, I sometimes call it black and white, or you know, uh, blue suits and and um, white shirt. I, uh, I at some point I felt that I'm missing, you know, this this female touch. I'm missing this um, female energy, and I want to have a female mentor. And this is where I. Um, stepped out and I applied for a mentoring program uh, with the PWN uh, Vienna community. Nowadays, there's even more uh, great initiatives and, and mentoring places. So please, one thing, if you don't have a mentor now at, the, at this point in your career, get one uh, immediately. Look around in your in your network. Look around in in different networks that exist here in in Austria or globally. So now I'm, for instance, a mentor in the Women Tech Network, Women Tech Net, and um, you know I meet with um, people around the world because the world is getting more and more connected, and we have the experience, uh, the possibility to have great mentors around the world who can take our career to the next level. And it starts with you, starts with uh, you um, asking, for, asking for help, asking for support, and actively taking care of your career. That's one other thing that I would like to really uh, underline here in this, this round is that your career is your responsibility and it's something that is um, uh, in most of the time in your hands. Of course, there are different circumstances. Maybe the company that you're working at the moment is uh, is, is not listening to you and, and to your idea. But thankfully, nowadays, there are so many opportunities around us and so many amazing companies who would love to have you on, on board. So as well, that is not that might be challenging and obstacle at the moment, but think further in the next months what you can create for yourself when you decide to step out for, from where you are at the moment and actively, actively take care of your career, actively start, you know, um, you know, managing your career, building long-lasting relationships, because that's the investment that you make for your whole life. So this is these little steps like the the you know meeting new people, 
building your own communities, getting a, a mentor is something that you can take with you wherever you go. So it's like it's your, it's your toolbox, it's your suitcase of amazing uh, things that you have achieved, skills that you have acquired, experience that you had. And it's something that it's not um, bound to any company, any position, any corporation that you are. It's something that belongs to you. And this is what's, for me, very much powerful about uh, getting that perspective and, and having, having a vision on actually where do you want to go and what do you want uh, to achieve in, in your life. So tonight, from my side, it would be to inspire you, uh, to inspire you, and to show you that as well, uh, it is it is possible. So if uh, if I have made it, who came here from uh, unknown, uh, sometimes they call it third world country, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, who is, which is very not far away uh, in kilometers, but uh, in, in 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 mindset and opportunities, sometimes very very far from the re unfortunately from the rest of Europe who uh, came here uh, on a bus and, uh, you know, a couple of uh, and few belongings that I have and started here from, from the scratch, actually from zero to 200. Um, if, I have, uh, if I have done it, uh, so I want you to know that you can do it as well. And if you have, you know, this, these times when you, when you doubt yourself and when you think it's not possible or I don't know which way to take, should I go left or right? Or maybe I want to stay in place for six months and I don't want to move from here. There are great people out there who, like, as I said, coaches and mentors or, you know, someone who, some of your role models or someone that you, you know, want to be your, 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 your mentor from maybe from your close circle. There are people out there who can, um, who can support you along the way, who can, you know, go with you on this journey hand in hand. And this investment that you do for yourself within these uh, six months, let's say what's usually for, for a mentoring, this investment that you do for yourself, and it's not like hours a month. It can be one, two, three, four, five hours, depending on, on where you are. So it's, we are not talking about thousands of hours that uh, we cannot afford. But if you stick to this and commit to make uh, this change, to commit to this uh, program and invest in yourself, then you will have the return on investment for your whole life. And this is uh, the, uh, one of the answers to how to land uh, three dream jobs without even sending resume. It's about actively investing in, in, in yourself. So beginning of every year, I look into um, what are the skills I want to acquire? What is that I want to, you know, where, what are the, the, you know, areas where I want to grow? And I first thing first invest in, in myself. Uh, in, in that way so definitely uh so to land job without sending cv has to do with you uh growing your yourself as a personality you taking care of your career as it's your own and uh, as well um looking for support uh from your community building a network building a network that as well is one of your assets that you can take with you where, wherever you go and whenever you need it. Yes, on the other hand, it requires time and um, you, it, it requires time, I would say. So it can be, uh, it can seem if you haven't done it before, it, it might seem very time, uh, time in uh, sense, so time invested, so time sensitive that you need like to do hours and hours and hours and then you, where, when I'm going to see the fruits of it. But as I told you at the beginning, it starts with one hour a week and it can go to um, many hours as you like, as fast as you want to go. Um, this brings me to, to another uh, story uh, is that, um, you know, it's about creating a life uh, you want to live. So for me, that's that's very, 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 uh, very important, and I keep that in mind with all the efforts, initiatives, and the communities, and and my my job. It's about me, you know, stepping out and and doing actively uh, what's 
best for for my career and my development. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, like to pass you on is that my network is my Google. So I very often, you know, tell that uh, everything for me happens to um, through the network. So I look, uh, you know, for uh, for advices. So I really al allow as well my network to support me on my uh, on my career journey, to support me on my mission 1000 women, to support me on now uh, currently I'm, I'm doing on the making it in, in Austria, um, having my YouTube channel where I interview people, real people who have made a career here, not just in IT, but in, in all industries. They made this career from the scratch here. So they came here as well on the same way and they they build up uh their they build up their career and now they have a successful career behind them they have maybe they have started their own businesses and so, and and they are as well ready to to give back to the community and serve the community as well and the third point is, is of course that um all of that takes time it definitely takes time so when i came here uh it started from zero now i can say that I have a um, pretty strong network, not just here in, in Austria, but in, in, other, uh, in other places as well, and that I have built uh, the bridge behind, uh, between Bosnia and, and Austria. So I, I never forgot where, where I'm coming, uh, so where I'm coming from. And um, I'm very much um, a, a grateful person for all this journey that, uh, and all this experience and all these amazing people that I did. If you would ask me, would I do it again? Would I just, you know, abruptly leave everything behind me and come here? Probably yes, because there are, um, when you ask me about my last seven years, there have been, there have been most, most exciting years in, in my life. Uh, and uh, we grown so much and we, we have here friends and, and family and so on and so forth. So it's been a very, very uh, good journey for us. And being as a being a woman in tech, being a woman in Internet of Things, being a woman in IT, coming here to Austria and facing that you know uh, where I come from, there's like 50% of women who study um, at the uh, electrical um, faculty in Sarajevo. So for me, of course, it was a little bit of shock um, where I came here and saw that there's not many women in in IT. There's not many women as well who are studying at a technical university and and they are they are working uh, in the IT industry. So it was a bit okay. I had to you know uh, comprehend that uh, okay and and be confronted with this question over and over again in in the companies like you you studied at the technical university you you are a woman and and uh, at the beginning it was like what are they trying to tell me. Uh, but uh, it was just as well for people to to, to see um, uh, it was unconventional. And I'm really glad that I see so many great initiatives like the new IT girls here with us tonight, that they're doing so many great things in, in the right direction and inspiring many, many women to join uh, the, the tech industry because we are 50% of society and we buy the same products like our you know our husbands or our uh, you know partners our male male colleagues so why shouldn't there be uh, you know on board on every company uh, women more women in uh, designing uh, those amazing products and uh, you know having them uh, for our needs so who who better can know you know what we need than than we women so my journey to here in in, uh, in tech was very, um, I would say, very positive. I must say it was a very positive experience. And I, what I try to say is that I turned around the coin and I used it as my advantage. Because please try to see it from the other side. Please try to see it as your advantage. You're bringing the value to the table, and you have the value. You're bringing the value to the table, and you have a unique perspective on things. And everywhere you go, people will want to uh, will want to know. So the real companies, you know, I'm not talking about companies who are living in 80s and you know they they just stuck somewhere else, but really about you know progressive companies. And if you're not in one of those at the moment, 
think of, consider about you know finding one of those where you can really use your potential and where the company sees you as an as an asset and where they ask for your uh, you know for your valuable inputs and insights and they they want you on on board to create you know whatever that they are doing you know making a world better place creating new products and so on and so forth so i would like really like to inspire you to think about in that way so what you have to offer and how you can you know make a make a world better place and if there's no room in the company for that there's also possibility to create missions um like I did, and like many, many women here in this room are doing. So they are stepping up and they're, they're, they're taking active lead and they are, uh, they are deciding to actively engage in their communities around them and, and be the change that they want to see in the world. With that, <laughs> Thank I you close. Very much. It's definitely a passionate topic about you, you have because I think there was no breathtaking in between. I <laughs> have. We got a lot no. of questions at registration. I want to ask you one of these because it, it, um, it's about the network. What are common touch points, communication channels to network? So I use very much, as you know, yes. Stephanie, LinkedIn. So for instance, that is the platform that I, I intentionally put all of my efforts basically over there. And because it's a network of over 700 uh, million users around the world, 16 million from that in that region, it's a business professional network. So it's not a Facebook, you know, like everybody's sharing whatever their opinion have. It's really very much uh, focused. And I see it as a very supported community. And if you're not on, on LinkedIn, definitely, uh, you know, start start uh, engaging there, start creating your content. Uh, that's the other point I want to say. You can have the most beautiful LinkedIn profile, but if you are not creating the content, no one is going what to find you. What do you think you. about meetups? Because you can meet there as well and have some... Absolutely, yes. but you need to keep in touch. So if I meet you at the meetup and then we close that or any Zoom call nowadays, how do we stay connected or club, clubhouse or whatever? So you always you know, need, need to have this point to uh, you know, keep in touch and where you share your valuable content as well, where people get the chance to meet you, to, to see, aha, this is what Stephanie is all about or, or Julia is all about. I want to talk to her. Maybe not now, but maybe in three months we have a we have a. How many hours do you do. use about in a week or a month for just networking and staying in touch with people? So depending where I am, so now, uh, last year I was using it way, way much more for the mission because it was it was very much necessary and all of my efforts were uh, were in that direction. So I was really very uh, consciously creating the content and engaging with, with the community in, th in that way because I was looking for different stages where I could, uh, uh, you know, tell my story. So then it was very much intensified. Now I use it, you know, as well... Um, for different projects and it might be more than you know one or two hours uh, a day but that's yeah. but that's me you know uh, yeah. at least it has to be let's say one hour one hour yeah. a day you were you know, introduced it's, it's... to me by my colleague Yvonne uh, with the uh, as the name uh, networking queen <laughs> so I think that says everything thank you so much and if someone wants to get in touch with you what's the easiest way to do so LinkedIn, of course, and uh, yeah, I have my Making It in Austria YouTube channel, so you can as well check it out there. Uh, I, I also answer those messages, so I, I'm Perfect. present over And there. If, <laughs> if someone is interested in the Making It in Austria, um, there's also a booth in the expo session. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Looking forward to connect with all of you. Have fun. Enjoy Thank the you. evening. It was a great pleasure. Bye. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Bye. So uh, I mentioned I mentioned before that we got a lot of questions um, from from the women, and there were two questions or two messages which um, touched me. It was one uh, woman texted that I just want to hear from other women in tech so I feel less alone, and I even now get goosebumps when I'm reading that. And the other one was, I'm attending for inspiration from other women. I think that's the reason, both are the reasons why we are here today. Yeah, I really have goosebumps from that. 
Uh, that's why we are here today. And now I'm happy to welcome Tanya Chenka. She's our keynote speaker from the sec for deaf I'm so happy to have you here also in the women's session today. Um, I have a long, of, a long list what you all are. You're founder of We Hack Purple, an online learning at academy. Um, you're the author of the book Alice and Bob Learning Application Security. Um, Woman in Security International, OVAS, Deaf Slop, OVAS Victoria. Um, you have your cyber security, uh, your security mentoring Monday, and you worked um, over two, 20 years in the in the IT now and worked at also um, at the giants like Microsoft, Adobe, and Nokia. So I'm so happy to have you here, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, which is about basically getting a professional mentor and how it can completely change the trajectory of your career. Um, so I was a dev for a really long time, and then I switched to security, and I did that with basically doing a lot of what Adela said, um, but without the thousand women, like a smaller number, but still quite a few. Oh, her talk was good. Um, so where I started, I was a happy dev. I was perfectly happy being a dev. I'd been a dev around 17 years, which is a pretty long time. Um, but then I met a hacker and he said, he spent a year and a half convincing me I should switch to security. and. I have to say, I was like, no way, nothing's better than software development. Honestly, I literally said that because I loved making software. But after a year and a half, he slowly showed me enough cool things that I became a hacker. <laughs> um, and then I ended up um, being fired by that professional mentor. So the first professional mentor I had was like the worst story of all professional mentors where um, basically, he offered me a job. I said yes. Then I got offered a much, much, much better job. And I said yes to that one. Uh, and then he got really angry and spread rumors about me until my job offer was rescinded. And since no one had heard of me and I was new, they believed him. And he fired me and I was really crushed and hurt. And I learned a lot about how much trust you give a professional mentor. And I'm telling you this so that you can watch for warning signs. So that professional mentor and I split off and then I found three new ones. And basically one of them, his name was Adrian. So every professional mentor I've had since then has either been good or absolutely amazing. And he said, I want you to speak at things. And so did Sharif. They're both like, we never have any women speakers. You should speak. And I'm like, I'm brand new. I don't even know security very well. I'm just a dev. And they're like, you should speak. And so I started speaking and soon it got, so it was almost like a habit, like drugs. I wanted to speak everywhere. <laughs> and then my professional mentor, Adrian, announced on the internet that I would be speaking at a conference. So I was speaking at meetups and at my office and just subjecting every person I could <laughs> to my security learnings. And then Adrian said, just keep doing it and keep doing it. So then I started speaking in other countries. And then eventually I was speaking at places all over the world, like Sec for Dev. And, um, and it became like this thing that I loved doing. It turned out, you know, I really love teaching lessons. And I started having companies say, can we hire you to come teach our devs all the stuff you know. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And then I founded my own company. And that's a lot of jumps that I wouldn't have made without people helping me, teaching me, and giving me really, really honest advice. And the first mentor was very biased. He wanted me to be a pen tester because he was a pen tester and he wanted me to work for him. But then I discovered application security and this was the thing I love. And a mentor that really has your back, who is the right one for you, will support you doing the best thing for you, as opposed to the best thing for them. 
And that was a thing that took me a while to learn. But I have more. So mentor got mentors got me here. So I had hacker mentors like Adrian and Nikki teaching me just like how to smash things <laughs> and how to like not make a bigger mess than I intended. And then I had application security mentors who taught me, you know, that you like the security of software is more than just running a test right at the end. And that there's so many amazing things you can do. And the security of software is like, where all of the things that are good uh, for my personality and my skill set. So like, I love talking to people. And so AppSec became that thing that really worked for me. But then I had startup and business mentors, business mentors that taught me like how to start my own business and not fail, how to set realistic goals, um, like when to ask for funding, when not to. And sometimes like we don't agree and they say, I think you should do this and I don't make that decision, but they still support me and try to help me do the thing. Right. And then now that um, so I, I accidentally got sort of really well known. It wasn't a thing I was doing on purpose. It just sort of happened because I just love speaking so much. And then it turns out I love writing. And so then I wrote a book. And so then I became sort of a public figure. And so I actually have professional mentors that help me know how to handle that. So for instance, like if someone's trying to hire me, I don't know how much to ask. I have no idea. People are like, do you want to come speak here? I'm like, sure. <laughs> and like asking for money was a thing my mentor explained to me I should do. <laughs> I know it sounds obvious now. Or like if I, you know, when you become a public figure, sometimes people can be really quite cool on the internet and like how to handle that and how to still feel okay. And without these people sharing their knowledge with me, I would have not gotten this far. And also it wouldn't have been half as fun. It's so fun to be able to tell someone, like to call my professional mentor and tell them a thing. So for instance, um, I got hired to an advisory committee and they hired a super famous white man to be on their committee. And they're like, how much do you want to get paid? And I'm like, I don't freaking know. <laughs> I don't know. How much were you thinking you'd pay me? Can I have the maximum of that amount? But that's not how negotiation works. So I call my professional mentor and she said, tell them you want to be paid as much as the white man. And I'm like, I don't know how much she's getting paid. And she's like, yeah, but you know, it's good. And so then I was saying to them, well, I want to be paid what well, he's being paid. And they're like, we're not paying you that. And then we negotiated from there. And that was way better. And that was her idea. And she's like, it's pretty gutsy to ask, I want to be paid what he's being paid. And I didn't get what he's being paid because he's a zillion times more famous than me. But I got a number that I felt good about. And that's the thing professional mentors can help you with. OK, next slide. So being a mentor is extremely rewarding. So you might not realize this, but if you've worked in your job or your type of role for two or more years, you have enough experience to mentor someone else who's brand new. And I have mentored so many people. Even when I was a dev, I didn't realize, like we would get students and I'd be like, you come here, I'm gonna show you stuff. You come here, I'm gonna show you more stuff. And that's how I became the senior dev rather quickly. Um, and so, when you see your mentees excel, it's magical. It feels amazing. Like when I saw one of my mentees speak on stage for the first time and she was super introverted and super shy, I can't tell you the pride I felt and happiness for her to see her just blossom because she's amazing and I could see it, but I needed her to see it. And they teach me stuff all the time. So like when you're the mentor, it's super fun. And like they'll ask you things and you might not have even realized that there's something you've been doing for quite a while that works until you say it to them. And I am just as grateful to the people I mentor as they are to me, if that makes any sense. Like they give, I don't know how to explain it, but when you mentor someone, it feels like they give to me. And I feel I've gotten so much from those relationships. Our field's changing. It's really, really changing right now. And if you participate, 
you can help us decide basically what it will be. Like, so if you are at this event, there's a good chance you work in security, but there's a good chance you're just interested in security. And I have to say, we want you. I'm not kidding. Um, our field needs you and we literally cannot do it without you. Um, and so I'm gonna give you some resources, some short, just a few resources that can help you. Um, so every Monday on Twitter, every single Monday, um, I, I like LinkedIn as well, but I find the notifications quite complex and overwhelming and they won't let me have any more connection requests, which I think really stinks. Um, and so I like can't talk to a lot of people and I find that it upsets me that I can't reach everyone on LinkedIn because of the way their algorithms work, but it is a really good um, platform just like Adela was saying. Um, but I use Twitter because I can reach as many people as people want to follow me. And every Monday, I use this hashtag Cyber Mentoring Monday, and I tweet out, do you need a professional mentor? Do you wanna give back to your community? Let's use this thread to help people find each other. And so I started this a few years ago, and I just called it Mentoring Monday. Um, but the hashtag got so big, and you know, people from universities, people from sciences groups, um, there's like a women's business group, a whole bunch of them all started using it and then it got so we couldn't find the security stuff. Uh, so I ended up making, changing it. So I talked with a bunch of people because lots of us were doing it then. So I think it's maybe been three years, three years, I think maybe, yeah, around three. Um, and basically, so many different people in our community use this hashtag now to call out for help or to answer each other. And then I go around like usually once a week and find all of them and retweet it because I have a lot of followers so that everyone can see each other. And, but there, it's not just me anymore. There's six or seven people every week that post. And then there's a couple people that just post once every few months and they get some new people to mentor and then they disappear again until those people graduate and then they come back. Cyber Mentoring Monday has resulted in a ton of people finding jobs a ton of people switching jobs, a ton of people getting promoted, a ton of friendships, a ton of mentors eventually just hiring their mentee because they're like, I couldn't possibly find a better person on the market that I would want. And this is one great way for you to be able to connect with people. When you use this, I have some tips. So one, say what topic you're interested in learning and what you've tried so far to learn. So, you know, I'm interested in learning AppSec and I've been reading blogs by these people and, you know, I followed this online course and, you know, I'm a dev and I really want to find a full-time job in this. So like, what do I need to learn? By doing that, you show you've already exerted effort, you know what area you're interested in and that you're willing to work really hard. That's the ideal mentee. Sometimes people respond and say, yeah, I want a mentor, give me one. That's like an advertisement so that no one will say yes, unfortunately, because it, it doesn't show any gratitude and it doesn't, it doesn't go that well. I've, I've written a bunch of articles about it, but basically if I were you, I would, I would search this hashtag and then let's say you want to learn pen testing or DFIR or risk management and just look for Cyber Mentoring Monday and then risk and then see what things pop up. You can answer someone from a year ago and they'll still probably talk to you. Um, the people who offer to help are just really generous. Okay, one more resource. Um, so I founded this nonprofit with a whole bunch of other women who basically, so like Adela said, I'd enter every room and it would just be me and like 30 dudes everywhere. There are so many pictures of me speaking at a conference and it's me in a room with all the other speakers and it's just me and a zillion dudes. <laughs> and I'm like, hi. <laughs> and so I wanted to make women friends. And I, I don't mean it to sound like selfish or simplistic, but I literally was just like, I want to have more friends that are women, but that understand what I talk about when I'm talking about work. Like I have friends 
that do sales and marketing that are super cool. And we go and like hang out and have drinks and awesome. But I wanted to just have women friends that kind of knew what I was talking about when I would complain about work. And so I just, honestly, me and my friend Donna just started having this little meetup and we didn't think anyone would come. I'm like, hopefully Nancy and Katie come. And then I thought maybe this woman named Poe. And those were all the women I knew in my city, really, that I thought might show up. And 22 women showed up the first week. And then more, and then more. And due to the pandemic, we now have an online platform. I should notice, like, everything's free. We don't make anyone pay for anything um, because we didn't want finances to be a barrier. And so basically like we have this online platform where we can all chat together and we started having online events. So we had to capture the flag a few months ago and WOSEC is around, I guess, three years old now too. And basically like, it's just a way for me to make tons of cool friends. And it turns out lots of other women have made friends. We have had women start businesses together. We've had women start nonprofits and open source projects together. We have had women hire each other constantly. Just lots and lots of friendships. We've had a lot of mentoring relationships. And we've also been able to stick up for each other. So if something super crappy happens, sometimes the other one can step in. Like, for instance, there was this young woman who was a new dev and this man was harassing her where she worked and it turned out I knew this woman that was like the director of marketing there and she went into that guy's desk but like into his cubicle and she's like dude this if you talk to her that way again blah 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 she's like I am on to you and if she complains to me you're done um and like being able to stand up for each other it it really, really helps, even if it's just to complain. Like when um, I had a job at a really big company and I found out I was making way, way, way less money than everyone else on my team and I was really upset. And then we all talked about it and they said, you should demand a raise. And they like kind of like pumped me up. So I felt confident to go and demand a raise. Now I didn't get a raise, but I did end up resigning and telling them where to go. Um, and I felt really proud of myself for asking for the raise, if that makes sense. And then I went on to start my own company. And although I am making, I did make less last year. I mean, I started my company last year and the fact that like, I still did pretty darn well, but not quite as well. I mean, like that's pretty good, right? Um, and so just having like, one of them was was joking, she's like, it's like we're a gang of girls and we should all just wear cute pink jean jackets. And I know that, that sounds so silly, but I love that we can all just be silly together, if that makes sense. And I know there's a lot of women's groups that are focused on specifically, you know, helping girls join STEM or helping with this or that, but WOSEC's actually about making lots of friends. And I know that that sounds simple and maybe, yeah, but friendship's really important. <laughs> Having a person that you can talk to and and tell all your secrets to and trust them is important. And having someone that understands what you've gone through because they've gone through it too is important. Um, and having peers. And so anyway, um, this is a free, another free resource for you. And then the last resource uh, is me. Um, so I run a company called We Hack Purple, and I wanted to make a small announcement. So last weekend, so I guess like just over a week ago, there was this uh, black woman on the internet who like I tweet at her and we talk and stuff, and she's just some cool lady I know. And she was saying, you know, the, the cost of training is so expensive, and how can I as a black woman ever afford that? And then as Twitter does, some ignorant people came in and said, well, they charge black people the same price that they charge white people. And I pointed out women make less than men. Black people in North America make less than white people. As a black woman, she has both of those disadvantages and on average makes significantly less money than a white male who are the largest percentage of our field and FOSEC in North America. And so like she has less opportunity to be able to pay for it to go. And that's the issue. And so then a bunch of us were talking about how that's frustrating and how could we 
turn the tables. And so I'm like, you know what? I own my own company. So I just offered 10 free passes for like the full training with the certification for women of color. And um, I offered it and 10 women said yes. And that's cool. And I registered them in my academy. But then a, a person wrote me and he said, I want to help. That's awesome. What can I do? I have a thousand dollars. So it costs a thousand dollars to take the three programs, get the um, the textbook and, and then graduate. And so he's like, can I pay for someone? And I'm like, yeah, we actually do a two for one deal. So if you buy one and you're giving it to, you know, a person from an underrepresented group, we'll match you at a rate of two to one. So we'll give away three. And he's like, oh, I'm in. So then I got to give away three more. Then someone else gave me two and I got to give another one and then another one and then another one. And now we've given 25 away. And then a company just wrote me and they said they want to buy 10. So that'll be 30, making 55 women of color that we will be putting through our program that are sponsored because our industry cares. And I wanted to tell you, because I know I need to stop and I know we need to be done, but I wanted to tell you, I feel the world's changing and you can be a part of it. And when women band together and when we lift each other up, we can do it. And um, that's what I wanted to say. So thank you very much for having me. And if you want to start a chapter, just let us know. Just let me know if you want to start a WOSAC chapter. I'm there. Um, sorry, if I, did I go over? I'm sorry. No, I, I have nine minutes left. So we have nine minutes for oh. I'll have okay. for you as well. And yeah, we were thinking in effect backstage area, like here in the office, like, should we open a chapter? Hmm, why not? So you totally can, and it's free. <laughs> um, yeah, right. We have an IC Square chapter as well, the Austria chapter, so would fit nicely. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes the chapters par partner together, if that makes sense. So yeah. they'll have women only chapter meetings, but then they'll join together to do other things. Um, so because you mentioned that, I mean, we had a discussion in the office today because this session here is really like women only. And we mm -hmm. uh, put a lot of thoughts into that and if we should do it or maybe make it more open. So what is your experience with which topics are better for the closed session? Which ones are better for the open ones? Because you have at the same time the problem when you have these open sessions where men are, are allowed, they don't come. Yeah. So we actually had, um, so when I, I lived in Ottawa for a long time and then I switched uh, and I moved across Canada, 5,000 kilometers to, to Victoria where I live now. And so in Ottawa, we had only women's events and same in Victoria, but some of the chapters have mixed events. And in Ottawa, we had this um, cloud hacking workshop and it was super fun. And around 30 minutes in, a man walked in and he goes to all my talks and he's like the nicest guy. And he walked in, he's like, hi, I'm sorry, I'm late. And like just rushed in and grabbed a seat. And I was like, oh. And all the women noticed him and all questions stopped. All conversations stopped. Everyone was suddenly silent. And he sat at the back and he was really quiet. And I like proceeded to continue teaching. And then maybe 20 minutes in, he went like this, he was like, And then he looks at his phone and he's like, and then he got up, he's like, hi, uh, I have to be somewhere and I didn't realize it and I'm leaving now and I hope you all have a really great night. And then he left and then he wrote me a letter to apologize. He's like, I'm so sorry I interrupted your women's only event. I'm so embarrassed. He's like, you should have told me. And I'm like, I know, but you're like my biggest fan and you're like the nicest dude. And like, and he's like, I'm so sorry, but it was amazing. So when he left, all of a sudden chatter, everyone's talking and so, um, I use that example and like, he's the nicest dude. He's definitely an ally. He's definitely, do you know what I mean? And it's not that he had any bad intentions. It's that then women aren't as comfortable. And so um, I don't know which topics are better, but I just know that women open up a lot more um, and feel more comfortable to say things if, um, if it's just women and non-binary folks. We do have some problems in some American chapters where it is illegal to not let men attend an event. Um, so we've had some men that are like, it's my right to go. And they're like, I'm an ally, so I'm allowed. And I'm like, if you were a true ally, 
you would respect our boundaries. Yeah. And so you clearly don't care what we actually want and you don't actually care about helping us or respect our opinion because it's our opinion that we need this space. So I guess you're not really an ally if you feel the need to show up despite us yeah. politely requesting you don't. And then usually most of them go away, but we still have problems with them constantly trying. And I write them a nice letter. Hi, Christopher. Hey, Derek. Um, this group's for women. And maybe you are a non-binary person. And if so, awesome, welcome. Yeah. But if you would describe yourself as a man or a dude or a guy, this isn't the right meetup for you. <laughs> so have a great day <laughs> leaving. Bye. <laughs> All the other WOSEC leaders are always like, oh, Tanya's going to go kick someone out. I'm like, yeah, because it's fair. It's reasonable, right? Like, yeah. Um, are there, I, I feel like I should look in the thing, but I invite everyone to use the cyber mentoring Monday hashtag, even if like, let's just say, you want to start a study group for something and you're like all of us are studying for this certification together you could use the hashtag and say who wants to study with me it just the whole, yeah i just want to connect people so i see there's no questions in the chat do you want to go to the next you have a question I, I have questions i got them at the registration so I have one question about security so one woman asked how can software developers be introduced more to security topics Ooh, um so i'm gonna be biased and say you should read my blog <laughs> if you look up she hacks purple so all squished together is one word i have a blog on medium and a blog on dev.to and that's all i talk about and it's free um there's also in a few weeks, my company's making a blog, but that's in a few weeks. I'm behind. But basically, we share lots of free stuff all the time. Um, there's also, so there's another blog that I really like called Hella Secure. So I'm just going to put it into the chat. Oh, yes. Thank you. So Hella Secure is run by my friends Aaron and Ray, and it's very practical security advice. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't read very many blogs and I read their blog every new episode. Um, I highly recommend that one. Um, there are also communities you can join. So there's the OWASP community. The second. You so can, they have chat. Yeah, you can insert the, the, the text afterwards. Just share. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So there's the OWASP community, O-W-A-S-P, and they have 300 chapters around the world. And it's free. You can pay to become a member if you want to, but you literally get nothing if you're a member. You're just making a donation. Um, and they have meetups and they have open source projects, and I love them. Um, we Hack Purple has a community. It's a paid community, and all we do is AppSec, and there's like little lessons and articles and discussions and events. Um, and it's closed, but it's opening in two weeks. Basically, like my company's doing a facelift and that's over in two or three weeks from now. And so I keep just telling people to wait. Um, there's also, so there's WOSEC. There's also, if you want to learn specifically hacking types of things, like red team penetration testing style stuff, there's We Are Hackers. And so that's hackers with a Z. And that's for women gender non-conforming people and non-binary and especially LGBTQ people. Um, and so they do capture the flags together and like hang out and smash things. And they're super nice. If you wanna do like bug bounty specifically, um, there's this woman named Katie Paxton Fear and she totally rules. She's the nicest person ever. And she has a community called Insider PhD. And it's like a Discord channel and everyone just teaches each other how to how to do bug bounties properly. And so you actually can like try to get paid because it's hard to get paid by a bounty. Um, but I would suggest starting with following Hello Secure, OWASP, me, um, We Hack Purple, and then it'll kind of like go from there. So I'm always suggesting like new cool people to follow um, because, yeah, I feel like more is more when it comes to sharing. I and just start. 
start anywhere. Just start reading reading blogs and and maybe yeah. watching also some cool black hat talks, right? To, yeah. to, get, to be passionate about it because everything else we can learn. It's just a toolkit yeah. you, you need after. Also, okay, also I'm ridiculous. You should read my book. Yeah, I actually wrote a book about application security that's for developers. That's my marketing team. We're probably just pulling their hair out. They're like, Tanya, Tanya, come on. Uh, so I wrote a book and it's meant for devs or anyone in IT that wants to learn about how to create secure software. <laughs> I'm so silly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure. I have to run a slide afterwards, but you came before. I'm going to mention it afterwards. I'm silly. Uh, so one last question, but I think we have about one to two minutes for the last okay. question, and then we start with the next um, next talk. So I have the question here: What kind of advantages do you have as a woman compared to your male colleagues? Is there any, or what are they? So there's some advantages. So for instance, if you apply to a conference. And your talk is like pretty good, but they've had no other women apply. There's a serious chance they'll accept you because they don't want to be that conference that has just dudes. And so I have taken advantage of this many times where, um, for instance, I'll be at a conference and they're having a panel, but it's all dudes. And then they'll realize, oh, no, it's a manal. That's what they call it, where it's all men on a panel. And then they'll look around and they'll be like, does anyone, I'm like, me, me, I'll take extra screen time. Absolutely. Because previously in my career, it worked the opposite way. So I'm like, yes, yes. Um, so that's one way it works to your advantage. Um, sometimes if, if you work in, so if you work in open source intelligence gathering, women have a serious advantage um, because society has taught them that we're harmless and they can trust us. And so if you're trying to do physical pen testing, like get into a building or something and you wear a pretty dress, it like works every time. It's, um, so, much fun. it's so much fun to do that. Yeah, they'll, they fall for everything because they don't expect a woman to be the threat. Um, so that's an advantage. There are disadvantages too. So sometimes an advantage is equally an advantage and a disadvantage, like I'm pretty. And so sometimes people assume I'm super stupid, uh, but sometimes people are way nicer to me and I get preference. And so like, yeah, it like, eh, sometimes it's really helpful and sometimes it's the opposite of helpful. And- um, But there are yeah. some advantages. Yeah, and also for instance, like I can wear a dress to an event and then everyone stares at me. And if you like having lots of attention, that's good. If a man wears a dress to an event, people will stare at him, but for a different reason, right? And so there's like, like we can dress more flamboyantly and like have attention at physical events. But I would say those are like all the advantages. And um, I would say there's, there's one or two disadvantages, but we don't need to name them. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Positive as well. So you yeah. can stay, Tanya because we, you are in the next session as well. So we start now with perspectives on, where we have um, a couple of speakers in the room. Christine Wallmüller, she's moderate, moderating that session. She founded the Woman in ICT chapter. And um, now the next 20 minutes, we are going, 16 minutes, <laughs> we're going going to talk about um, education and learning. And here we have Tanja Janka from before, from We Hack Purple. Here, Gerhofer, um, she is a mentor at Female Coders. And Daniela, where is Daniela? Can't find her. And one is missing, but she's going to join as well. Daniela Ravisa, she is Technical Product Manager at Dynatrace. So I give the mic over to you, Christine. Thanks. And go back. Thanks, Steffi. Everybody can hear me right now? I hope, hopefully. Okay. So it's always exciting to do a hop-in event <laughs> with so many, uh, so many interesting women. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to having me as a moderator of this uh, very interesting session. I hope you are still joining us and you're not uh, too tired right now. <laughs> um, and yeah, I want to introduce my first panel. Uh, we are doing this the session perspectives. First of all, I want to say something about me. My name is Christine Wallmüller. I'm working in the ICT sector uh, since 
since more than 20 years right now uh, in different positions. Um, first of all, I started working as a journalist and then I uh, worked in the telecommunication industry and uh, followed by the software industry. So I'm quite experienced in this in this field, I suppose. Uh, since 2016, I'm working also as an IT journalist, specialized for software and software development and software issues, also in the business, in the company field. And um, um, I founded Women in ICT in the last year. So quite before the pandemic started in uh, February, we started with Women in ICT, which is a special interest group in the Austrian uh, Association of Software Companies in the FOSI, in the short form FOSI. And uh, first of all, I want to um, in, invite you, everybody invite to join Women in ICT and take a look. But uh, in fact, now we are talking about the perspectives on education. Um, I'm very glad to meet Tanya as well. <laughs> um, Daniela, she is technical um, a product uh, technical uh, the manager at Dynatrace, a sponsor of this session, this interesting session, and Pia, you are software developer. But I think everybody of you should introduce uh, yourself. You should introduce yourself um, in uh, in the following minutes, and we have about 20 minutes for this uh, this part of the session, uh, followed by. Uh, two other parts, as you see at the schedule. And Tanya, uh, you you mentioned your book only for some <laughs> short minutes, but I think you should tell us a little bit more about your interesting book that you wrote and your motivation of writing this book. Which, uh, I think we shall start in this way. Okay. Um, so I wrote a book called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. And Basically, when I switched into this niche of security, there was no book I could read to learn how to do it. And there was no course that I could take to learn how to do it. And there's so many different companies desperately trying to recruit application security people. And I'm like, it feels like there's like this giant gap here. And when I worked at Microsoft, I started writing a blog. And Microsoft kept saying to me, you have to scale yourself. So instead of like flying on a plane to every single place you want to speak, what if you could do some virtual events and some in person? What if instead of flying, you could write more or stream more? And so I was like, oh, you know what would really work if I wrote a book? And they're like, yeah, you should totally write a book. And I didn't have time while I was there. I waited until I quit. They're like, ah, that's a great way to scale. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to start my own company and like create training. And they're, that will be the best way to scale. And they're like, no, that's not what we meant. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they inadvertently put the idea in my head um, that I should scale, right? And I also just wanted a book that was easy to read about security. So I'm dyslexic. So I'm not a person that says they are, I actually am. And so when I get, you know, the Web App Hackers handbook and it's literally this thick, I, it, to me, it's like, it's like the enemy. I'm like, oh God, this is gonna take forever to read. It's gonna be so unpleasant. I want the information that's in it in my head, but like reading textbooks is really hard. And so Alice and Bob are the characters that were introduced to all of security in 1978 when they were trying to show us what encryption was. They wanted to show the normals, the non-mathematicians, how encryption works. So they're like, Alice wants to tell Bob a secret. And so we're always using Alice and Bob in examples. So I made Alice and Bob have jobs, families, health conditions. And so they follow us throughout the book with little stories. So it's still a textbook, but it has stories of what happens to them. So if you don't use the security header, this could happen to Alice. Or, you know, Bob's sister got divorced and she didn't change the settings on their photo privacy. And then someone deleted all their family photos. It's like, oh no. And so it helps explain how these things affect real people. And so I wanted to make a book that was like fun and easy to read that would teach security. And so the reviews are coming in quite positively. So I guess I did it. 
Fun is a, yeah. is a good, is a good, uh, good point. Um, Bia, is it's also fun for you for to and also a motivation to work in the coding field, so as a software developer, and also in the female coding club, uh, I suppose, and also Cola Dojo. But perhaps you want to tell us a little bit more about your engagement. Sure. So I am a part-time teacher and part-time software developer. So one day a week I'm a teacher, four days a week I'm a software developer, which is a pretty cool cool combination in my opinion and next to my professional work i'm active in two programming clubs mm -hmm. one is the coda dojo where it's our goal to teach programming to kids kids starting from six years on upwards and the other is a programming club for women where it's our goal to have fun and program together and currently we are focusing on software security uh -huh. And what was your motivation to start? <laughs> Great, excellent. What was your motivation to start in, in, in the field of teaching at the Coda Dojo, for example, and also for the for the female coding club? Well, for teaching in general, the motivation was just well into to the kids program club I came more or less by accident. Somebody just suggested, hey, you might enjoy this, and I tried it and I enjoyed it very much. For the women's programming club, it was a bit different. On the one hand, we got the inspiration from another event that we went to in Vienna. In Vienna, we went to a Women in Code hackathon. And we were there, and it was a really great day. 50 women, most of them new to IT, developing programs for a whole day. And in the end, a lot of tiny projects were, were made and completed. And it was really great. And we were like, why is nothing like this? in Linz. We need something like this in Linz. So this was our inspiration to found this club, some other colleagues of me and I. And the motivation is that you're always asked, why are there so few women in IT? What can we do to get more women into IT? And now that's kind of our answer. We try to get more women into IT by enabling them to easily learn it. It's an important point when we have, we have so less, um, few women in ICT and also in the ICT security. So that's very important to give them an impression, to, to give role models and to show them that uh, we are really wanted to work, to be worked in there. So many companies are telling me right now we want more women in working in their companies, but we are still missing and uh, we don't want, we don't know how to get to them. So that's a big problem. Uh, Daniela, perhaps can you tell us a little bit about your company? Company about Dynatrace and how did you decide to get there? A little, a little bit about, about your career. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my my name is Anila and I'm uh, working part time uh, as a as a product manager as a technical product manager at Dynatrace. So I'm I'm also always looking to to scale Tanya. So <laughs> to reiterate your point. So scaling is, is also very important uh, uh, to me. Uh, and so I, uh, I studied uh, informatics, uh, computer science uh, here, here in Linz. So I'm, I'm located uh, in Linz. Uh, also Dynatrace, uh, so my office is located in Linz, uh, but um, we are also scaling um, uh, across Austria, so we have a uh, an office in, in Hagenberg, which has been uh, recently opened. We have an op office in Vienna, uh, in Klagenfurt, um, and uh, our headquarter is, is actually in, in Boston. So we, we are a, a, a U.S. company. Um, yeah, and well, so why, why did I decide uh, to, to study computer science? So Um, and I also. So now I think we have problems with your, with your, with your uh, connection. Daniela, can you hear me? Okay, now this is getting off. Perhaps, perhaps. Pia, I can uh, I ask you in 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 the meantime, um, what is your motivation? What was what what was your motivation to start in the ICT field or to study uh, software engineering, let's say, or to, to to engage yourself in this in this field? Yeah, it was 
pretty much a lucky accident. I, after I did my Matura, I was just not sure what to study and I decided for software engineering. Hey guys, can you, looks like yes, my connection back. issues are, yes, are back. Great to see you again. I'm very sorry about that. No problem. Mm, not sure I, if, if you guys can, can hear me. I can unfortunately. No, it's fine. It's fine. Just just go on, Daniela. Not here. And, I can um, hear you. Okay. Awesome. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. Go on. It seems that uh, on, only only I'm having connection issues. Um, right. So so I think uh, that you that you can uh, easily uh, change. Oh yeah. So Evelyn just just told me that you you did not hear um, my answer why I studied computer science. Uh, so I I I would like to um, to tell you again. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Right. So I I have uh, I've always been in how complex things work under the hood. Uh, thought that. Um, a, that there is still a large number of, of problems that, that are unresolved. Um, and you can also choose from a large variety of, of industry um, branches. Um, so you can you can even um, change uh, from, from one branch to another branch throughout um, uh, the, the career. Yeah, but do you think it's difficult to start yeah. as a woman in the ICT so, so what do you think? Okay, I think we lost her again. Should should I go on? So I I can um, I can also tell you a little bit about um, what Dynatrace is doing. Uh, so Dynatrace uh, helps its customers to to tame modern cloud complexity. Okay. Um, and we do this with observability, automation, and intelligence uh, all all in one platform. And uh, as, as a technical uh, product manager, so um, I'm responsible with, uh, for, for working with customers. Uh, so I, I need to understand customer requirements, uh, their, their use cases. I need to, um, to take in market demand. Um, and <laughs> Oye, I think we lost again. Perhaps, perhaps we can, uh, can also be understood by um, by uh, product engineer. Oh, now we lost her finally. So no problem. But perhaps we can. Um, um, we have only about some minutes left for, for our part. But uh, what do you think is the most important? I ask you, Tanya, and you, Pia, both. What is the most important um, tip or recommendation for? our young women especially watching this session what can you recommend to be in the um, ICT sector what is important about education life and learning we heard about mentoring we heard about hacking a hacker school Tanya your 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 inspiring talk and presentation but what is the most most important what is what should be um, um, and a tip yeah just to end this session in a positive way I would say that being competent and then being confident that you are competent. So go learn the thing you wanna do and then know you're good at it. And then a lot of other things flow away from you. So like when I was a dev, if I would start working somewhere, sometimes you know the other senior dev would be like, oh, they hired some pretty girl. And I would just wow them every time. And I knew, oh, I know how to do this shit. So I wouldn't ever feel insecure because if there's a thing I didn't know, I would go learn it. So then I wouldn't feel insecure anymore. And I feel like society tells women we should have a lot of doubts about ourselves. And I know you can't just turn it off. But if you feel insecure and like, I don't know a thing, go learn the crap out of that thing and then solve your insecurity. And then people can tell at work. People can tell in interviews. People are just like, Oh yeah, her. We should hire her. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. I know it's easier said than done, but it's it, much it more difficult. sounds great. <laughs> the kids are really so, but it's it's excellent, and I think it's a very important message. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks a lot, Pia. What, what, what do you want to add? Something. So I don't want to contradict, but I think it's also important to know what you don't know. And if you don't know something, just say so. Don't don't be ever ashamed to not know anything because nobody knows everything. So also just say it when you don't know something, ask for help before you learn it. After you learned it, you know it. And concerning lifelong learning, what, how do you get fit or you, uh, you make your fit, Pia? What, what do you want to add? How do I stay active? I go to a ton of meetups when there's not currently a pandemic going on and I try stuff. So I think the best way to learn stuff is just to try stuff. So when there's a new technology that I'm interested in, I just try it. I do a little stupid project that I will never need again, just to do something. And I think about most important from my part, what I'm doing perhaps to add my, my personal view is um, that um, every day is a, is a learning day. So for me, every, every day is a day where I can learn things, where I can read things, where I can get new contacts and new interesting perspectives. Make, make sure that you're um, gaining new perspectives every day. So that's a very important point in my, in my, my personal opinion. And so I say thank you to my interesting panel. And we're coming to the next panel, which is next part of my session perspectives, which is concerned. So now where's my plan? <laughs> Too many people around me. Um, I think this is the step two and two is challenges in work life. And I ask now to come on stage, Alisa and Johanna. Hi. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. Hi. Great. <laughs> Excellent. So the next 20 minutes are ours. <laughs> and I'm very, very glad to have you here. So um, on the one hand, Alisa, you're a hacker and advocate and also security leader, quite well known. And Johanna, you're a key researcher at SPR Research. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to see you here, having you here at, at this session, Challenges in Work Life. And perhaps we begin in, in this way that I'm a, I give you my personal view again, <laughs> because I have a mother of three children. And in, in, especially in these times, it was not so easy to manage the last year in this Corona um, uh, time. And um, I want to ask you both, how did you get along with this time? Uh, I know, Johanna, you have a little bit, a little son, <laughs> which is not so easy. Um, Alisa, perhaps your, your personal perspective, starting with Johanna right now. Hmm. How did I come over the year? Well, um, we had to, to come to the conclusion that we need daycare and we mainly insisted on, on bringing our son to daycare because it's just not possible at the, at, in a different way because we are working, our grand, the grandparents are working, so there's no chance. Okay. And I think it was it was rather a big thing to oppose the pressure and the social pressure that was uh, I live in a small village where there was social pressure among especially the mothers that uh, the kids stay at home but if you have to work there's no way I can't do my work with my son next to my side and um, I always say the people who say home office and children uh, are fine they either have not understood what home home office means or they have never watched after a small child okay thanks for this first statement <laughs> lisa what's about you yeah so thankfully my kids are all older and so and i've got kind of a separate office space so the noise day to day wasn't as much a problem but for me what it really is was getting out of here at the end of the day you know, I think, um, you know, I've been working from home for years, right? And even for me, and I know a lot of people who this was their first experience working from home, it's hard to just put it down at the end of the day and say, I'm done working for the day. I'm going to go be a part of my personal life now. I'm done with work. And so for me, there was a lot of that, just learning how to 
disconnect and remember that, you know, where I worked maybe 40 or 50 hours a week um, prior to COVID, you know, there's no reason for me to now be working 60 or 70 or 80 hours a week just because we're in COVID time. And I think a lot of people kind of buried themselves in their work as much as a way just to escape everything else that was going on, mm -hmm. um, as well as just kind of learning how to be at, a work from home person. So really it was, it was very much about blocking out time on the calendar. You know, being very, very specific about, all right, this is the end of my work day. I won't accept meetings after this. And I don't start work until this time. I won't accept meetings before this. And, you know, and it, it's hard sometimes because there is that pressure. And especially as we're working with international teams, but that was that was a big part of it for me was just making sure to, to walk away at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But I think you started in a new role right now in January, isn't it? Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your role as a business information security officer. Um, uh, what is your position about and how do you manage your day? Sure. So it, you, it's actually perfect that you bring that up because that new position has challenged some of what I used to do. So um, my role as business information security officer, as you mentioned, or BISO, for S&P Global Ratings. And my role is really to bring business context to the security space and bring security into the business line. So I actually, where CISO, you know, CISO reports into like a centralized function, my role is specific to the division that I work within. And it's to take everything that they're doing at that high corporate level and say, well, this is how it applies when we consider what our business is all about. Um, but what's been really interesting in this role and a little challenging from a time management perspective is that even though I worked for a global organization before, it was there were just a couple offices and it, it, it was pretty structured how we interacted. Well, now I've got people in India, for instance, who for me in the United States, they're 12 and a half hours offset from me. So I'm going to bed, they're waking up kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to then, of course, I've got people in Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, all truly around the whole globe. And so it's been one of those where, okay, maybe I do need to take a 6 a.m. meeting or a 7 p.m. meeting. And those do happen, but then build in time in the middle of the day where I can break away. And like I did today, go get my car cleaned because it's dirty. That's what to organize. organized. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, you, have to, you have to make sure you build those times in, though. Uh, Johanna, what's about you? You're working as a key researcher in SPR research, which is not so easy to work in, the, as a, full, in a full-time job as a young mother. Um, how do you see the position as a young researcher working in, in, in your main challenges right now? Mm, my challenges are... At the moment, so I established a team starting one and a half, two years ago, and we um, or the team increased in size quite quickly, and, and we are now nine people. And at the moment, I'm just trying to keep all things together because um, I have a lot of young people who need more introduction, who need more um, more interaction. Um, that's one challenge. And now in addition, we have um, COVID, the COVID pandemic. So we're sitting at home for a, about one year. And it's hard to, I think it's easy to interact with people that you know from, from the physical world because you know them and you know how to act. But if you integrate new people just online or you maybe m m might have met them one or two times, it's it's really challenging and it's also if we know each other quite well and usually I know when somebody is stuck in in somewhere and this is really hard to find out so you have to be way more explicit than when you meet regularly at the office mm -hmm. that's um 
do you think is does a child means a career decline today or do you think it is difficult for for women especially in science to make your to 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 be in career and to make the steps forwards in the career it's hard to say um i think i cannot say it at the moment it's a statistic with n is one so not very uh, representative um but what's what's your but compared with other branches and with other time it's best definitely the best way. Uh, so on the one thing, uh, IT is really flexible. And on the uh, so for example, in our company, people without children have sometimes weird working times because they go up, they want to go up late and then they work late. So I think I'm, I'm not that extraordinary when saying I have to leave because I have to pick up my son from kindergarten. I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe it's a, even a better reason to go away than say well it's just my my cycle of the day um so i think it's a good way to work in it but i cannot say whether it has an impact or not but i also think that my generation may be the first or maybe the the second that will try and go forward and we just have to find out Okay, Alisa, your children are a little bit older. I don't know how, how old are they are right now, <laughs> but perhaps you can tell me. Um, but do you think the same question? Do you think is a child is a means a, a step down in career or a break in your career, or is it possible to step forward? So it does become somewhat challenging, right? And um, yeah, my my children, my youngest is 16 at this point, so I'm. I'm a long step removed from having, you know, small children, but, you know, I, I think, um, you know, in our world today, it's, it's better than it used to be right for women 15 years ago. If you were having a child that meant without any question, you were putting your career on hold, but I think we're seeing more and more. And, and indeed I work with some women who, you know, had a child and, you know, their partner is the one that's staying home and, and is taking care of the kids or they've adjusted their, their work-life balance. Um, you know, as, as Johanna said, kind of even with just the, the flexibility and ability of things like working from home and, and being able to work odd shifts, I think we are in a much better place today than we were even just even 10 years ago um, for women to be able to not have to be the always the ones that are at home. Now I say that, but there's also some statistics that tell us maybe it's not as good as we had hoped. Mm -hmm. And that is at least here in the United States, during the pandemic, women disproportionately have left their jobs compared to men, like a, a far greater number of women than men have left their jobs or mm -hmm. been, uh, you know, let go from their jobs. And obviously, a lot of that is still that that kind of traditional sense where when someone's got to be home to take care of the kids, it's usually the, you know, the woman that does it. And so um, so while I think it's better and there's definitely more capability. We certainly have a lot of progress to go. Lot, lots to do yet. It's a good point that you said uh, home office and the challenges for women in home office, especially right now, because I talked today also to a big round expert around business leader of sea level. And they also they told me the same that for women, uh, they're involved in home office and homeschooling to, to care about the children. Uh, it was really a difficult time for, for many women and, the, and the big disadvantage let's say uh johanna how did you manage this time uh, this corona time with your son and was it difficult for you as well um at the beginning yes but um we managed somehow but i think in this case it was good that um my son is still very young so he for him nothing changed or almost nothing changed because he still goes to kindergarten and that's it um I think that the challenges were more for people with kids in in primary school or so. So um, so it was quite fine for me, and we just did proceeded our mix of um, 50 50 and one brings the kind the child to kindergarten, the other one picks it 
fix him up. Uh, that was actually quite fine. And I also save a lot of traveling time going back and forth. Um, that actually has become lots uh, easier. And it will become even easier next changing to another kindergarten, which is closer. So fine for me. Getting easier. <laughs> Getting easier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, perhaps a question you're both working in ICT security. Uh, is uh, what do you think? What are the main reasons why are so few um, women working in the field of ICT security? I was at a big ICT security conference and there were 400 men in Austria, a big security conference, 400 men, and 10 women. <laughs> so you can count it with your with your fingers. So what do you think? What are the reasons why? Do women uh, decide to to work in ICT security, or why are so few women working in ICT security? So I, first? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I there's a couple of things I've seen that I think I play into that, right? I think first and foremost is just the hiring practices in security, in particular. Um, you know, the hiring managers are very used to looking for people like themselves. And while maybe they don't do that necessarily looking for a specific gender, a lot of what they recognize in other people that they want to hire like themselves is a result of the fact that they're the same gender. So, you know, men will experience things very differently than women. And so when I'm looking for very specific experiences or very specific approaches to things as a hiring manager, if I'm a man, I might be looking for those same things that are just more inherent to a man. So there are those just in those biases that exist. The other thing, quite honestly, and I, I hate to go there, but it, it's necessary that we recognize it, is there are definitely toxic behaviors with some men in this industry where when women get here, they're not treated well all the time. There are a lot of those issues. And I mean, I see it every day, women who are driven out or who are at least on the edge of leaving the industry altogether just because of the way they get treated. Okay. Okay. Johanna, what's, what's your opinion? Mm, I think it's a, it's um, a lot of roles and, and which gender should uh, do which jobs. So for me, it was always clear that, that women can also do the technical stuff because I grew up in a family. So my parents were both uh, engineers. So for me, that was a really normal job that can be done by both genders. And I just realized when I went to a technical high school that there were actually no girls, which was kind of strange for me because so in my family, it's rather uh, that maths and, and, and sciences are ma rather a female thing than a male thing. And um, I think it's a lot, uh, the roles and the jobs that we connect with certain genders. And what I also see that the, the girls or the women who are there, they typically have somehow in their family someone who has done this job. So I think it's a lot about role models and that young women have can come in contact with, with women who do this job and see that they are still women and not wrong males. Good point. <laughs> Good point, Johanna, because we did an, an, an role model event in last November um, concerning ICT security experts, a female ICT security mm -hmm. experts, and we had only female uh, speakers at this session and I think it was very impressive and afterwards some um, young students from uh, different schools came to me and they said oh it's so interesting as a woman I can uh, work in the ICT security so I think we need really need role models Alisa what do you think and how do you get along yeah no that, I think that's that's a critical point that you've touched on there is just that need for representation for, and, and that extends to not just women, but any underrepresented group, just to see that there's people like you that are in that same job that are doing those things. And to understand that if I go into this career path, I'm not going to be alone. I'm not going to be the strange person who decided to do that. There's lots of other people just like me who are capable and who are doing this and who are achieving high levels within, you know, the industry and they're very, they're very well known and very prominent and I can see them up there. So 
that's something that now I can aspire to be as well. I think that kind of representation is crucial to getting more women into the industry. I think it's a very important point, and that's also why we are engaged in, in, in Austria and in, in the women in ICT and also in the new it girls and also in the technical university. We are, we are doing a great job to to attract more young young um, students to go to the university as well. Um, finally, uh, can you give us a little bit motivation for our <laughs> um, for our audience? Um, what do you think? What are good recommendations? And what um, should young women do? Can young women do to get along and to manage their challenges? Alisa, can you start? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the the biggest thing is get out there and interact with as many people as you can. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Use social media to your advantage. Um, you know, I, I tell people two years ago, three years ago, you know, I was speaking at maybe one or two conferences a year. No one really knew who I was. I was pretty quiet. I was pretty reserved, pretty shy. And then at the start of 2019, I really, I got active, but all I really did was I started interacting with people on social media. I, I went out to Twitter and I got involved in conversations. I asked questions. I shared my ideas and let other people ask questions. And just by doing that, you build this network and you, you not only do you learn and, you know, gain friends, but now you, you start to see where, where you might fit comfortably. And, and that's something then that you can start to go after. So yeah, just, Get out there, know that you're not alone, and don't be afraid to talk to anybody, no matter how big of a name they see. They seem like, you know, we're all equal. We're all just people. So, great. Thanks for your tips, Johanna. The same question to you. Hmm. I think I just can. I I just can support Alisa's uh, statements, and always bear in mind that the other people are also. Maybe they are also afraid of talking to others. Uh, so um, the others, so, uh, the others are, might be or might feel just the same as you, and they are usually also quite happy if you make the first step because then they don't have to do it. So just try. Just try. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm so sorry, our time is running out. <laughs> Thanks for for your time and for your inspiring um, talk with, with you. Um, yeah, I've asked to um, come on stage for the third part now, right now. Bye, see you. And now we are seeing Violetta, Evelyn and Dani. Hi, Evelyn. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, Dani, Hi, everyone. nice to have you here. And still Violetta is missing. So we wait some, some some seconds, ah, she's coming. <laughs> Hi, Violetta. Great. So this is our third part of our very interesting, inspiring, I hope it is an inspiring session. Um, it's a concern about leadership. Um, I think it's a still a, a very crucial <laughs> uh, point that uh, women uh, often have problems to get in, along in their, in their career. And I'm very glad to have you here. Role models that women can do this step and um, can reach a leadership position. Um, perhaps you can you share your experiences with us. Um, try to look uh, to, to um, give a little bit of insights and how to get there along and to get a leadership position. Um, Evelyn, can I start with you? You founded a startup, very interesting startup. Can you tell us a little bit about your your, um, your career path and how did you get along to found a startup in, in the field of software testing? Uh, sure. So I I started my, my technical education already in, in high school and I went on to study computer science. And sad, sadly, after finishing my studies, I did not really have it on my radar to found a company. So I think one important thing is to like widen the horizon of young people already during education. So they know that this, actu that this is actually a step they can take. And question now is how, how did I still end up founding my company? Um, my co-founder, Marcus Zimmermann, had the idea to 
fully automate um, writing tests for computer programs on basis of source code analysis. And to do that, you need to solve um, lots of challenging alg algorithmic problems. And that was what got me hooked in the beginning. So Simflower was a leisure time project because I wanted to work on these problems and I wanted to figure out how we can do that. And um, gradually, Simflower became my second full-time job um, in addition to the usual paid one. And you usually cannot do that for a very long time. So I decided at some point to drop my usual job and do Simflower um, full-time. And that is basically how the Simflower story started. And I'm now working since four and a half years at, um, at building up the company. But I think you're very successful. I don't know how many employees do you have right, right now at the moment? Perhaps it um, We are now 13 people. Sorry, I didn't get it. We are now 13 people. 13 people. Which so is it's quite cool. Yeah. For, for just a short, a short time, let's say. And um, is it is it difficult to be accepted as a woman as a, as a on the C level in an IT uh, company um, right now in a startup? What do you think? Mm. I think it's, I did not really have um, bad experiences. So I think you you get accepted quite well. There were just um, like one incident that um, we do usual um, one and ones between employees to give each other feedback. And one employee told my, my co-founder um, well, it's it's really fun working with Evelyn. You learn very fast that she's not just here because she's your girlfriend. And it was meant as a compliment from his side, but I was like taken a, ba um, a bit sad about the statement because it proves you first have to prove that you're good at your job and people do not necessarily expect you to be just because you're, you are in a position. Um, but I, I thought about that question quite long, and that was the only negative thing that happened. And that's quite good for already several years. And uh, I think we mentioned in the, in the um, session um, before that it's, it's very important to be concentrated and to be um, uh, focused on your job, yeah, and to say, okay, I'm, I know my, my, my competence and I know my skills and I know what I can. So to be more self confident as, um, yeah, as a woman, I think that's a very important point. Um, yeah. For you, Dani, <laughs> you are a cybersecurity leader at KPMG. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, career and uh, how did you get along to get in the leadership position? Um, for sure, Christine and Evelyn, congratulations for the amazing journey you've gone through and just keep it up, right? I always say uh, good women should support each other. So we're very happy to see you as a successful young entrepreneur. So well done to you. Um, well, my, my career was quite, you know, as I, as I always joke about it, I, I say you sort of learned up being in cybersecurity by chance or rather by accident. Um, when I graduated, and I'm not here to show my age, but uh, <laughs> maybe many years ago, we did not have cybersecurity degrees, right? So I, I graduated as a, in, as a major in computer science in Bulgaria, uh, where I originally am from. And then I just was curious around, you know, just playing around technology and academic networks. And I moved around the world. I, I, I lived in Asia. I worked, um, just as Evelyn say, you, you're passionate about something. You, you learn computers. You learn how you break them. And then ultimately, uh, you know, about 15 years, 16 years ago, you know, I really moved into a bit more cybersecurity. And it was really around reviewing technology and reviewing systems, trying to look at, well, how would bad people try and get in and at that time just steal passwords right that was the most complex things one can do so really for me it was about trying to the curiosity perhaps the passion around understanding right and we always come back and i've listened to our previous um, uh, speakers as well and i, I truly confirm for me it's really about the, the trying to be good at what you are trying to do right try and understand that that gives you self-confidence then you're passionate about it and then just people see that right 
I also think that for me, it was about there was that little bit of different things I've explored. There was there were always problems within our clients. There were problems within the organization. So I was the type of person who go and say, oh, don't worry, we'll find a solution. Right. So I always advise people when you think about a problem, there's always 101 problems. Right. But for every problem, there's a solution. So one advice I give to people is just try and find a solution. Try and think positive about the challenges we are facing, right? Or the challenge your client is facing or your organization is facing. The easiest thing is just to go with the flow and, you know, not finding those. But for me, the one thing which helped me be where I am is the constant motivation of trying new things, new solutions, perseverance, being passionate about it, engage with executives, try and ask them, I always say, remember one thing, there's never a silly question, right? Usually they're mostly answers, right? But there's nobody which stops you of saying, mm-hmm. I do not know. I would like to ask, but I would also like to help, right? To find the solution and really work towards that. So that that's really me. And it's always, I've been very fortunate to be provided um, by my organization. Uh, I've been with KPMG now for 11 and a half years in my career. Um, more than 20 years in, in IT, right, more broadly, uh, 18 of those within cybersecurity space. So it's really been around, you know, go through it. It's never easy at the beginning. Persevere, keep going at it. I say just keep going at it, right? So it's going to be fine. Just keep going at it. Try and ask questions. Try and find ways. Try and find solutions. Um, I'm sure that even Evelyn will confirm that nothing works first time. Right. But you need to keep going at it and find another way and try again and try again. Get up. Right. Pick yourself up. Try again. And I'm sure you will be successful. So that's just the right point is this this, um, idea to just try and find solutions to be really uh, concentrated on solutions and not on problems, but to solve to solve the problems and to get along. Uh, Violetta, it's also a very um, um, perspective on the scientific area. So this trying, trying out, try, try things, try and failure. It's a big advantage in science. (laughs) I'm sure I worked in science as well, so I I know that. Uh, But can you tell us a little bit about your um, career at Salzburg Research and your work? Yes, so uh, of course. Um, I was studying actually close to 30 years ago. I was studying um, computer science in Serbia. And um, uh, when I came to Austria, uh, I was already 35 years old. And I was really surprised with the difference that uh, exists, that gender disbalance that exists, because in Serbia, for example, that uh, that is unknown term, absolutely. Even today, we have prime min- min- minister who's actually a woman. So, uh, and uh, I think at the moment, just as a preparation for today's session, I had a look at the um, uh, at the um, uh, numbers of students, female and male, for example, for ni- 2020 year, and the uh, number is close to 60% uh, in favor of female. So 60% of female are actually uh, entering the university in Serbia uh, in 2020 in comparison with male. And my experience was, for example, I was working, this is a bit unusual, most likely unusual, but not from anyone coming from a communistic country. Uh, I was working as a developer for the biggest national bank in Serbia. And um, we had one um, area, um, IT, uh, just with uh, application developers. I'm not talking about system developers, for example, or technical stuff, but just application developers. We had 40 application developers out of uh, which 38 were female. So we had only two male, for example. And the number of uh, users um, and cars that you were uh, doing application for, it was close to 2 million. So practically the the whole banking system of the the biggest banking system of the serbia was in in um, in hands of uh, female programming what? software <laughs> so that was absolutely impressive but i was absolutely not aware of difference this is different in austria so in Salzburg research i actually faced the 
reality of a different non-communistic world <laughs> and um, it is uh, it happened to me for example i was invited uh, for the Fachhochschule to be a mentor of a girl uh, they said she's the only one student at the uh, computer science and um, she's getting very frustrated so then i actually realized that this is very 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 serious and something should be changed absolutely so girls you head up <laughs> and uh, we can absolutely do that. Um, so I think it is very important for a female to be present in research, in uh, de development, in, for example, European Commission is asking for girls to join for review of the research proposals because we have a different attitude and um, we value probably different things than uh, male. So I think this job and the future of the uh, research and of the development or the, the entire digitalization um, of Europe definitely needs um, our um, attitude and our on our brain. Um, so my experience right now at Salzburg Research is um, I'm mainly working at the uh, European projects. I'm very often, I really enjoy writing proposals for the new grants, uh, not only for European, but also for national, uh, for national Austrian projects. And um, I was um, in November, for example, we finished one Austrian project where I was working, I was absolutely amazed with the environment. They usually put me on European projects because of German. I'm not so fantastic in German language. And um, um, so whatever way, I mean, there are so many options in um, IT. It's not everything about security or it's not everything about uh, development. So there are other um, options to try, for example, to write research papers, to write um, research applications, or at the end to organize some events and uh, to organize education and to learn more. Um, also something that is very, I think, privilege of today um, um, professional life is that there are so many courses actually so we can always try new things so there is no need to be you know to to be married to one specific tool or to one specific area we can always learn and try new things and then at some point you will find something and courses are everywhere from Coursera for example uh, to um, of course to 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 free uh, education that many offer especially now during the COVID uh, phase I have a small team at Salzburg Research uh, they are mainly uh, developers coming from Sri Lanka, for example, they are fantastic. And um, uh, we are working, we have a, um, also a team working on cybersecurity, but also some other matchmaking and knowledge based AI technologies uh, put in the context of European projects. For, for example, we're building digital platforms and uh, Things like that. Yeah. yeah, and you have also female um, workers in your team, female um, software developers in your team, Yoletta? Um, not really. So we had one girl and yeah. then she, she went, mm -hmm. um, she left us. We are working a lot with the cloud uh, technologies and um, um, I think especially in order to, to get very good and qualitative stuff, we definitely not need to look outside of the Europe even. Because, for example, I was talking with my mentor who is sitting in Belgrade and they are still not educating students uh, with the, um, Kubernetes and uh, cloud technologies, something which is really very required for our our um, our European projects, research projects. So we are using advanced technologies and we need education which is mainly not traditional, not offered through the traditional um, uh, educational channels in 
also in Europe. So I really hope that this is going to be changed because many people, in order to learn these technologies, they need to self-educate practically. I saw there was some very question about can we actually, without studying computer science, learn something? Yes, of course. So Because there are so many courses, you just need to try to be ready to experiment with technologies and to try some new technologies there are so many blogs and uh, also GitHub uh, projects which can actually help uh, people to get into the topic um, very, very quick. Good that you mentioned that. Yeah, that's very important. Um, perhaps finally, because we have only about um, some minutes left uh, right now, um, I like that a young daughter from Danny is coming in. <laughs> it's really nice. Danny, I like, I really like that your daughter's coming in <laughs> because it demonstrates <laughs> our life. That, that's the best thing from working. From home. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. But do you have uh, finally some tips how to get along in your career and what's the most important thing for you to, to come along or to, to stay fit also and to, to, to be, we, talk, we discussed also lifelong learning. So what's important to stay in a leadership role to be successful on the long run? Well, I, I actually, for me, as I say, I think it's the, the one big thing is be open for, to change, right? Be open to and persevere all those issues, including your children working from home and having to deal with all different challenges. Um, Hi, Emma. Mommy, 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 don't love me to stay myself. <laughs> so we deal with all different type of issues, but I think the important thing for me is really just persevere, be happy what you do, and just keep going at it. Great, excellent, Tani. It's, it's fine. Uh, Evelyn, can I can I ask you as well for a young woman? What's your uh, recommendation also for for young women to who want to found or who want to who don't dare right now to find to found a, a company, your own company, uh, or their own company? What's what's important for them? Or what can you tell them to make them to give them a little bit of motivation? Mm. I think you you should be scared of founding a company because the um, Verantwortung, what's the English word? Sorry for that. Uh, uh, to, to responsible, to be responsible. The responsibilities, they, they grow with um, each step you take. So um, you do not have a company at the day you start working on it. So it grows gradually with your experience. And that is the good thing because you grow with it. Great, excellent. And Violetta, finally, ask you um, what do you recommend young women who want to go to, to science or cybersecurity science? What, what can you recommend uh, them? Mm. As I, as I mentioned, so there are a lot of courses. So I think education is definitely necessary, but that education can vary. So it, there is no need to have official education, probably. Uh, or even if you're studying informatics or computer science, you definitely need always to continue learning because we cannot stop learning with uh, this uh, um, uh, attendant of um, changing technologies. So technologies are going so quick. Uh, they're really changing constantly. Something is good today, then you have to transform into something different. So that means you need to stay open-minded and for everyone who's coming as a new in technology this is just good you know find something start experimenting trying out start building your small uh, projects and uh, start creating storytelling start creating stories about that and for example blogging or um, networking with somebody so it will all at some point interlinked and come in um, in a way like job or new projects or that passion definitely needs to 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 have a flow through the whole life and if you like technology then that's that's it just learn try things and uh, you will find your place. <laughs> and with that very inspiring uh, <laughs> a view or opinion, I give back to Stephanie. Do you have some questions as, as well right now, Stephanie? Or I give back to you. Okay. To stay in time. 
Yeah, we are a little bit um, over time. So I, I'm going to save the questions for afterwards for the breakout sessions. And thank you all of you for for your time and for taking your time, even when the kids are next door. I'm, I don't have mine next door today, so <laughs> I'm kind of safe. But it's it's nice to always to see them that it's just life and they come by. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're going to see you afterwards in the breakout sessions. And we will continue by, thank you. We will continue with Hannah Wunsam. She, no, perfect. Um, she's CEO of Austrian Startups. She's Managing Director of Austrian Startups and Austrian, uh, the largest platform for promoting entrepreneurship in Austria. And previously she took her first step in the world of CEOs in founding a green tech startup and the current role and her current goal is to give more young people the courage to pursue their own ideas. And she will talk about entrepreneurship and startups. Hi, Hannah. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Well, when I was in high school, I actually wanted to become a teacher, like every 10th Austrian girl. Other options were maybe going into medicine or psychology. I definitely never thought of going into entrepreneurship. Like 59% of Austrians, I never even considered starting my own business. Startups were for me something very far away. Some guys that are developing the next Facebook, Twitter, wanting to make money very quickly. That was until I, for the first time, stepped into the Impact Hub Vienna and learned about the concept of social entrepreneurship. It's the practice of combining economic, social, and environmental sustainability. So building products and services that don't only are good for the society and the environment, but are also profitable. I was hooked. I wanted to learn more and actually dove deeply into the entrepreneurship ecosystem. I took every opportunity to learn, either being it at the Pioneers Festival, the biggest tech festival in Vienna, or organizing the Entrepreneurship Avenue, or going into the Students Innovation Center, learning how to support social startups. And I learned that with technology, we can actually build the most important solutions to the biggest problems that we are facing. But it still took around two years until I really discovered what entrepreneurship is really about. Actually, it took me until I had this one problem that I was so urgent to serve, to solve which was that there was everywhere waste of takeaway packaging. By that time, I was studying at the University of Economics and Business of Vienna, and everywhere I was looking, there were takeaway packages of cups and bowls. And I was thinking, can't there be a smarter solution, a more sustainable solution for all of this packaging? At, at some point, I stopped complaining, which is something that we do a lot in Austria. We have a very special word for it, it's Sudan. And I started to actually think of ways how I can solve this problem. And together with two university colleagues, I developed Refill, a sustainable, smart solution for takeaway packaging, understanding for the first time what entrepreneurship really means. It means creating solutions for real problems that are out there. We pitched at a lot of pitching competitions. We won some of them. We implemented our solution at a big canteen of A1, a telecommunications company. And I understood that even though I didn't have a tech background, if you have access to technology, if you have people in your team, who are capable of building the solutions together with you, you can make incredible things happen. And I was so 
impressed by all of the opportunities that are out there and so curious by the path that I had taken that I was thinking, actually, I would love to inspire more people to also realize the potential to make things happen, to implement their own ideas. And this is when I came across Austrian Startups. Austrian Startups is the biggest platform for entrepreneurship in Austria with the vision to making entrepreneurship as common as skiing in Austria. And so I joined them and I actually got the opportunity after a while to become their CEO. And this was because I was believing so much into them, this vision to make entrepreneurship as common as skiing in Austria. Why skiing? Well, in Austria, you might know that at the age of three or four, your parents, they put you on the skis and they push you down the slopes and you fall and you step up again and you fall and you step up. And after a couple of years, you race down the slopes like nobody can stop you. And this is the mindset that we also want to establish for entrepreneurship in Austria, that you can try things out and you can fail and you can try again and at some point you will find the solution and you will actually race to the top. Today I would like to reflect shortly on my journey so far and share with you my three most important learnings when you want to actually start implementing your own ideas, creating your own solutions. To start off with, I have a lot of people that come to me and tell me, well, I would really like to start a business, but I don't have this burning idea. But this is actually the wrong way to go about it. Ideas don't just fall from the sky or pop up like a light bulb, like this big picture that you always see. Actually, ideas develop because you see a problem that you can't stop thinking about and you start thinking of ways of how you can actually solve this problem. For me, it was the ways laying around the campus. For Anna Iarotska, she's the founder of Robo Wunderkind, it was that even though programming is the language of the 21st century, we can't find it anywhere in our school's curriculums. So what Anna created was a toy which enables children to learn the basics of coding in a very easy and simple and playful way. So my first tip is to look for a problem that you really care about and then start looking for solutions. Now, let's say you found your problem and you already started a th a thinking of a solution and then the next problem that a lot of young entrepreneurs are facing is that they come to me and say, well, yes, I have this brilliant idea, but I can't tell you about it. I can't tell anyone about it. What if they steal my idea? But this is also the wrong way to look at it. In order to create solutions, you need to talk about your idea. Because firstly, by talking about the idea, you're going the first steps of making it into a reality because you're actually getting accountable. People will ask you for your project and how you proceed it. And you will actually get valuable feedback to your idea. What do others think about it? You need to talk to the people that will use it the best way. And if you are having a technology background, then you probably are even um, easier able to do it is to build a very first version of this product or service. We call it the prototype. And then go with this prototype to your eventual customers and let them play around with it. Let them use it, see how they are interacting with it. And then take the feedback and build it into your product and create with time and time something that is then actually valuable to your customers. This is what Bianca Bussetti did the founder of Journey. She talked with her friends first about the idea. She built a very simple prototype and let them use it. And in the end, she had an app which makes, let you make photo books within only 10 minutes and is hugely successful with it. 
I won't lie to you. Creating a startup or starting your own idea is not always fun. Actually, it looks a little bit like this, the valley of despair. At first, you think everything's awesome. This is the best idea ever. You're going to rock this. And then the more you learn, the more you see, okay, actually other people have worked on this before. This is not so easy. At some point you're down there on this dark valley of despair. And then you need two things to get out of it. Firstly, you need persistence. You need to believe that this problem is so important to solve and that you actually have the cap capabilities to solve it, that you stay through these hard times and learn with time that, okay, maybe there are solutions to the problems that you're facing. Maybe it's not that hard anyways. And then you again, get up into the high. What also really helps you to get out of this valley of despair is a team that you can trust and that supports you. And that also when you have a bad time, get you out of your valley and you can support them if they have doubts. This is also what Victoria Wojcik did. She's the founder of Instastreamly. Instreamly. She has always been a gamer, um, which is anyways an industry which is mainly man dominated. And she had the idea to combine branding and video game streaming and actually enable brands to, to show their branding on their streaming platforms. And she was faced with a lot of difficulties. People telling her that a girl doesn't belong into this industry, that she doesn't know the industry well enough, but she really believed that there she had a case, that she actually knew what she was talking about. And she persisted and actually went on to build a highly successful company in Poland. Those were just three examples of women who were brave enough to believe that they have an idea that is worth pursuing and that they have the capabilities to actually implement their solutions. And I believe that every one of you in the audience has the potential to do the same. And if you don't want to wait for others to build the products that will define our future, then I can very much recommend you to start looking into an entrepreneurial path. If you want to go this path, you are not alone. There's a big community of support out there. Female founders, for example, they are supporting female entrepreneurs in Austria and the whole of Europe. They have a cool event coming up next week. It's called Lead Today, Shape Tomorrow. Um, and I can very much recommend you to sign up and listen to a lot of others, very successful entrepreneurs and leaders um, in the female founders ecosystem. Or if you really want to go one step further and have an environment that helps you to take your first steps as an entrepreneur, you can join the Entrepreneur Leadership Program. It's a one-year program where you have weekly workshops, discussion evenings, and most of all, work with a very interdisciplinary group on projects and your own startup ideas. You can still sign up um, till the 28th of February, and I would be very happy to hear of you and answer any questions that you have to the program. And with that, I can very much recommend all of you to have a look into entrepreneurial opportunities around here. I think you all have the potential to implement your own ideas, be it as a startup, be it within your company, within your workplace. Don't be afraid to believe in the ideas that you have. And now... I'm Hannah Wunsam, I'm CEO of Austrian Startups, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting all of you.